General Aviation, it's an industry comprised of 650,000 pilots flying over 200,000 aircraft. And the missions of General Aviation are as diverse as its pilots and aircraft, and the individuals and businesses that own them. Unfortunately, an unacceptable number of these General Aviation aircraft, their pilots and passengers, have succumbed to senseless and often tragic crashes. And the highest percentage of these crashes have been caused by human error, namely pilots making poor safety of flight decisions. What's even more alarming is that the same mistakes are being made over and over again throughout the industry. As you go through this training and watch the scenarios, we suggest that you should concentrate heavily on the error chain depicted in each scenario and how these steps ultimately lead to a crash. Ask yourself, what were the contributing factors? Were there opportunities to break the chain? Did the pilot exhibit a specific safety attitude or value system that might have influenced his decision making? And were there direct and or indirect pressures affecting the decisions of the pilot? Now, let's begin the scenarios. Ray owns and operates his own computer consulting business. He has worked hard during the past eight years owning this business, but it has finally paid off. He was finally able to fulfill his lifelong dream of learning to fly and owning an airplane. For a private pilot with about 250 hours logged, he made a good choice when he bought a used Cessna 172 that was in very good condition and included a radio stack that would allow him to continue on training for his instrument rating. The prospect of being able to use his 172 for business from time to time was also exciting to Ray, and the day to do this had finally arrived. He had an important meeting scheduled for 6 p.m. that evening at his office with one of his top clients. Another client requested a service call for earlier that day in a town that was a three-hour drive from Ray's office, but only about an hour and 15-minute flight using the 172. So Ray agreed to fly up to this location and perform the service call. That morning, Ray checked the weather and it showed decent VFR conditions prevailed, but the forecast was for 2,000 foot ceilings and three miles visibility for his return to his home base, which were exactly what his personal minimums were for flying in daytime VFR. He decided to go. His destination was a busy airport, mixing airline and general aviation traffic and an airport he'd never been to before. So Ray took a few extra minutes to study the airport runway and taxiway diagrams in order to avoid any runway incursion incidents, finishing preparing himself for the trip, and then filed his VFR flight plan. Ray arrived at his hangar with plenty of time to perform his typical detailed pre-flight of the 172. He started the engine and taxied out for takeoff. After completing his thorough run-up checklist, he was on his way. The outbound flight was enjoyable, especially since his tailwind was much stronger than forecast and he was making a great ground speed. And Ray's airport preparation also paid off. His arrival went perfectly from his coordination with approach control in the tower to his ground operations into the ramp. Studying those airport charts surely helped. His service call was successful, except for the fact that it took two hours longer than he had anticipated to complete. Although he still had enough time to fly back home for his 6 p.m. appointment, his time was now tight and he had none to spare. Ray arrived back at the airport with the weather still looked good. He elected not to take the time to update his home base weather conditions or file a flight plan for the trip home. After quickly checking his oil, Ray started up for his return flight. After picking up his clearance out of Class C airspace, he taxied out for departure. Following the takeoff and leaving Class C airspace, Ray was on his own. The weather was obviously worsening, and his ground speed was significantly lower than his outbound trip. He was beginning to become very concerned about the weather conditions and about being late for his 6 p.m. appointment. He pressed on, having to continuously maneuver to stay clear of clouds. But that task became more difficult as each minute passed on. At times, he found himself between layers of clouds with no ground contact at all. Finally, as he neared his destination, he spotted a hole and decided this was his chance to duck under the clouds. His descent became rapid and he worried that he wouldn't break out when he reached his personal minimums of 2,000 feet above ground. But he reasoned that he was in a familiar area and decided that if he was ever going to get into his home field, he had to keep going now. Not having tuned into the ASOS, he was unaware that the weather conditions had diminished even more significantly at his home base field. 
Hal was the type that is successful in everything he does. His chain of pawn and gun shops throughout the Southeast United States had done very well over the past 30 years. He was not afraid of hard work, demanded peak performance from his employees, and it showed in his business results. But his greatest passion was his flying. Since the days of his first flying lesson many years prior, Hal approached his flying with a fierce intensity and desire to excel. He bought his first airplane immediately after getting his private license and began obtaining additional ratings. As his business grew, he upgraded airplanes so that he could more effectively visit his regional stores. Although the higher performance aircraft rewarded Hal's thirst for a challenge and return on investment, he most enjoyed flying them just for fun and could often be found visiting small grass strips in out-of-the-way places. And when Hal finally sold his chain of stores and retired, he immediately sold his business airplane and bought a tailwheel sport plane, similar to what he learned in. Hal was now back doing what he enjoyed most, flying for fun. He spent some time refreshing himself on tailwheel airplane flying techniques, which did not present a significant problem to Hal, and he didn't expect it to. He also had an instructor friend work with him for a few hours, mainly to show him a few basic aerobatic maneuvers. The day had finally come when Hal was to make good on a promise to take one of his longtime friends for a ride in his new plane. His friend Larry had been looking forward to this and was ready to go. Larry had flown with Hal many times in other planes, so he was not only comfortable around small planes, but he had a high degree of confidence in Hal's abilities. Hal briefed Larry on the particulars of the new plane, and they were soon departing. The flight started quite well, and Hal and Larry were having a good time. Hal then demonstrated one of his newly learned aerobatic maneuvers, which Larry thought was great. Larry then asked Hal if they could fly over his house because he had family visiting, and they knew he was flying with Hal. So Hal agreed, and they found Larry's house. After a few circles, Larry asked Hal to go lower and buzz the house, which Hal did. Then Larry asked Hal to do one of those great rolls he did earlier. Hal hesitated at first, then reasoned that it couldn't be any more difficult than it was at altitude and agreed to try the low altitude roll. So on the next pass, Hal went ahead and entered the rolling maneuver. Guy was a successful consultant for a prominent commercial insurance firm. He was also an experienced pilot with commercial and instrument ratings and thousands of hours of accident-free flying logged over the past 20 years. His present airplane, a Cardinal RG, was one he had owned for the past five years. He took his aircraft ownership seriously. He would regularly take recurrent flight training to keep his skills sharp, practice his basic skills often, and took an equally active role in the maintenance of his airplane. He recently treated himself to a completely new avionic stack for his plane, and he was understandably anxious to take a trip with his new gear. He felt he deserved it as a reward for the high-pressure, long-hour work environment of his profession. It wasn't long before the opportunity for that trip came about. He had just signed a new high-profile client, and his boss told him to take a few days off. Because Guy was also a certified scuba diver, he decided to fly his newly equipped plane to a resort location for two days of diving. On Saturday night, after he finally wrapped up his paperwork, he carefully planned his trip for a Sunday morning outbound flight, two days of diving, and a Wednesday return. The next morning, he did another weather check, worked up a weight and balance, and filed his VFR flight plan, since the weather was perfect. He also calculated that the trip could be done nonstop and still have him arrive with at least one hour of fuel remaining, which was his personal minimum. After a detailed pre-flight inspection, including a visual fuel inspection, Guy loaded the airplane with his luggage and dive gear and departed for his vacation. Once level in cruise, Guy pulled out the instructions on his new avionics and began playing with the equipment. The time went by quickly for him, and it didn't seem long before he was entering the pattern for his diving destination. The next morning, his diving activities began. This first day was his planned heaviest day of diving, with a shorter day of shallow dives planned for the second day, so that he would have plenty of time to rid his body of nitrogen before his Wednesday flight home. His first dive of the first day was a deep dive to explore a wreck, followed by a more shallow reef dive to finish out the morning. That afternoon, he dove another wreck in relatively deep water, and then finished out his first day of diving with a night dive later that evening. 
His problems began when he returned to the hotel and received a voicemail to call his boss at the office no matter how late it was. During the call, Guy's boss told him that the new business deal was starting to go real bad and the client demanded a lunch meeting for tomorrow. Arguing the issue didn't seem to be an option for Guy, so he said he'd depart first thing in the morning and be there by lunch. He was a little concerned about the time between his last dive and the flight, but figured it would be enough. Early the next morning, he checked the weather and filed an IFR flight plan because there were some IMC conditions along the route. Then he called the FBO and ordered a top-off for his departure. The line crew fueled the plane before he got there, but did not top it off correctly, leaving the plane short of full tanks. Guy hurriedly pre-flighted and climbed in for departure. In his haste, he didn't visually check his fuel levels this time, nor did he even review his total gallons purchased when he signed the credit card bill. He believed he had full fuel by his gauges, even though he knew his plane could indicate full, even when not completely topped off. He quickly got into the air for his homebound trip. This flight home wasn't nearly as enjoyable. Guy was consumed with the varying weather conditions, dealing with his new and unfamiliar radios under IFR, worrying about his business deal, and also wondering why he was having such discomfort in his arm and fingers, which worsened as the trip progressed. With about an hour left to go in his destination, Guy suddenly realized that his fuel gauges were indicating quite low. He had also forgotten to do his regularly scheduled tank switching routine for long cross-country flights, and his selector had been on both for the entire trip. The weather had finally improved, and with nothing but wooded terrain ahead between Guy and his destination, he briefly considered stopping and checking his fuel. But the discomfort in his arm and unfamiliarity with his new navigation equipment and his belief that he didn't have the time to go to another airport and make his appointment caused him to quickly abandon that idea and hurry home instead. Plus, he reasoned that his total time for this leg would be about the same as his outbound leg. He did get his tanks topped off, and his gauges must be wrong. So, he continued on for his home base. is a privately rated pilot with an instrument rating and about 350 total flying hours. Most of his experience was flying a Cessna 182. In the nearly two years since he received his instrument rating, David's proficiency had digressed, reflecting the fact that he didn't spend much time on his skills. He was mostly a kick the tires, light the fire kind of pilot, which showed in just about everything he did with his plane. His pre-flight preparation was usually minimal, and he never considered weight and balance. He would quickly go through the pre-flight and takeoff checks. His takeoffs became more hurried and were never consistent, and his on-route routine was to usually let the autopilot do all the flying. Even when going into unfamiliar airports, no matter what size, he would never consult the airport charts before the flight and just dealt with airport familiarization as he arrived. He would often hurry his patterns and neglect providing Unicom calls or listening for airport traffic advisories, which at times created dangerous situations. His landings were also pretty much in line with the rest of his flying skills, barely adequate and far from being precise or consistent. But the forgiving nature of the 182 when it comes to flying skills and load hauling had kept David out of trouble in spite of his declining skills. The time came when David felt like he needed to move up to a faster, more complex airplane, so he bought a Bonanza A36. The insurance company required that he receive five hours of instruction prior to operating the airplane on his own. His buddy, who was an instructor, provided this instruction. However, instead of using that time for a thorough transition to the Bonanza, they spent about an hour doing takeoffs and landings and then used the rest of the time to take a cross-country trip for lunch. After the checkout, David flew it for about another hour or so, mainly just cruising around the local area. He also spent plenty of time boasting to his friends about how great this plane was and how quickly he could get to his favorite resorts. The day soon came when David and three of his friends planned a vacation trip. He requested line service to top off the plane, and his friends arrived shortly thereafter with all of their luggage. The only thing was, an additional passenger showed up a few minutes later. Without David's knowledge, one of the friends invited the unexpected passenger along because he needed a ride to a town about 100 miles away and ride along their route to pick up a car he had recently agreed to purchase. David was not very happy with his one friend offering this ride without his knowledge, but took a quick look at the sectional chart to find the airport and determine the runway length. 
with about 2,800 feet of runway shown, he figured the plane could handle it, didn't want to say no, and continued loading everyone and their luggage. Not having done a weight and balance calculation, he was totally unaware that the airplane would be overloaded and out of CG. In his typical fashion, David didn't waste any time getting out to the runway. The takeoff was nothing like he'd experienced before in the Bonanza. This was his first takeoff in the A-36 with a full load and was actually overgross, which significantly degraded the plane's takeoff performance. However, with the runway being over 5,000 feet, he was able to finally get the airplane off the ground, cleaned up and climbing. David was not happy with the performance of his plane. The rate of climb was far less than he was used to, but he eventually got to his cruise altitude and once there, the airplane behaved more like he had grown accustomed. It wasn't long before he had to begin his descent for his first stop. When he arrived at the airport, he closely looked over the field at pattern altitude and noticed the trees obstructing both ends of the runway. He flew a full flap higher approach than normal for him, which resulted in his speed being faster than normal for landing on a shorter field. He was using the approach attitudes that always worked in the Cessna 182. After floating down nearly two-thirds of the runway, David decided to go around. But with full flaps, full power, heavy nose-up trim, and an overloaded airplane, David's new airplane became more than he was prepared to handle.